Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Claire Kim, your MC for today's event. It is my great pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the 94th Sokia Test Korean Lecture Meeting. First of all, on behalf of AKS, I'd like to express our deepest condolences to the um, families who lost loved ones uh, in the disaster which happened a few days ago and send our best wishes for a quick recovery to all those who were injured and affected from that disaster. Okay, and that makes me more grateful <laughs> for your presence today. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Jiyeon Kwon, who is going to give us an insightful lecture titled Resplendence and Virtuosity of Korea Art. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce Professor Kwon. Dr. Jiyeon Kwon is a professor of arts and cultural management at the School of Fine Arts at Hongik University since 2014. And also, she was a Dean of Office of International Affairs of Hongik University from 2014 to 2019. She achieved her doctoral degree at Princeton University in East Asian and Korean art history in 1999. All right, I believe we are in for a real treat tonight. Without further delay, please welcome Professor Jiyeon Gun with a warm round of applause. Okay, my topic today is on choreo art. Um, and before I begin to talk about the artistic achievements, I would just like to give a brief introduction about the state of the field. And in today's people's minds, uh, maybe including yourselves, uh, traditional Korea has often been uh, referred to the practices and customs of the Joseon dynasty. Uh, and uh, however, many of Korea's foundations were laid out during the preceding Koryo dynasty that lasted for almost 500 years. Korea derives its current name from Koryo, and despite of its significant position in Korea's history, Koryo is a relatively less studied period. The standard history textbook written by Lee Gibek and translated by Professor Wagner of Harvard University, for example, only dedicates one eighth uh, of uh, pages to Koryo, while the uh, Korean art history uh, book uh, written by two former professors of Seoul National University, dedicate uh, less than 10% uh, of the entire book to Koryo art. Now, this is due to a number of factors, uh, including the fact that uh, we are a divided nation, uh, and major archaeological sites of Kaesong, uh, the former capital of Koryo, uh, is inaccessible, right? And the relative scarcity of primary sources uh, and the primary concern of post-war Korean historians to correct the colonial distortions which most severely affected the ancient period and the Joseon dynasty to justify its colonial rule. So, uh, you know, the uh, post-war scholarship had been mostly uh, focused on the ancient and the Joseon dynasty. Increasing number of historians are, however, paying greater attention to Korea today uh, highlighting its relatively more open, egalitarian, dynamic, and pluralist society than the following Joseon dynasty. I'm sorry to say this if there are any Joseon scholars here. But um, contrary to Joseon's strictly male-centered Neo-Confucian axiom and its vassal position to China, uh, different religious beliefs such as Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, and native traditions coexisted in Korea and internationally, it positioned itself on equal footing with the neighboring Song, Liao, Jin, and Xixia kingdoms, referring to its ruler as emperor and not, a, and not king. Hereditary rights applied to daughters as well as sons, and such pluralist and egalitarian social environment obviously echoes more closely to today's norms, uh, making Korea a more appealing and relevant period to study today at least to me. Now, the founder, Wang Gan, uh, succeeded in bringing order out of the chaos of the later three kingdoms and united the country in disarray through marriage alliances with local gentry families throughout the country. Apparently, he had 20 wives. You know. He also warmly welcomed the elite refugees of the fallen Bare kingdom that existed in the north uh, and fell to Liao and generally uh, gave them land and titles. 
the bone rank system, uh, status system uh, that uh, existed in the Shilla period, which was a you know hierarchical uh, system, was abolished, and the establishment of a civil service examination in 958 opened government post to talents throughout the country. So it became a merit-based uh, you know system where anybody with talent could participate in government positions. The capital city was moved to the center of the peninsula. Uh, it was called Kegyeongden, uh, which is current uh, Kaesong in North Korea, uh, which was the home base of the founder and an active commercial city burgeoning with shops and foreign merchants. Uh, now this is a 18th century painting, it's much later, but uh, of Kaesong. And you see it's being uh, you know, filled with shops and, and crowded with houses. Um, and on the right is, um, on, in the back you see the uh, Songaksan uh, that backs the city. And on the right is the um, former grounds of the palaces, which were torn down at the end of the Korea dynasty. And recently there has been uh, joint uh, excavations uh, north and south uh, of the uh, Manolte. So not much remains, but there are things underground. So these are, these are the stairs that lead up to the, uh, to the palaces. So far from being a hermit kingdom, uh, Korea was commercially prosperous and politically savvy vis-a-vis -vis the changing vicissitudes of its neighboring states and Buddhism functioned as a protective and unifying religion of the country. The annually held rituals combined native and Buddhist traditions, filled with festivities, and also visited by foreign dignitaries. Now, art played an integral role in the political, commercial, and religious activities of the dynasty. As a result, Korea produced some of the most resplendent and remarkable cultural artifacts in Korean history, attaining unparalleled technical virtuosity and finesse. Today, I'd like to, be, I'd like to explore some of these artistic achievements and the forces that nurture them. Okay, so I'd like to start with printing technology. Uh, now, the Buddhist Tripitaka, now this is the, how we call the collection of the Buddhist scriptures, which became a major religion all around, all over Asia, right? Uh, this was translated from Sanskrit into Chinese characters, and we belong to the, uh, you know, Sinicized uh, Chinese, the Buddhist tradition. Now, this was carved in its entirety uh, twice in Korea. Uh, compared to China, we completed it only once. I mean, although we, um, you know, we, um, we imported it from China and also the Kitan prints, and we carved it based on them, but we, during the Korea dynasty, carved the entire thing twice, which was, I mean, compared to the size of the country, this is pretty amazing undertaking when you think about it. Now, the main motivation for its carving stemmed from the belief of its talismanic powers that could protect the country from foreign invasions, that could maybe turn the fortunes uh, to our favor. So there are the invasions from the Kitans in the 11th century and the Mongols in the 13th century. So these were carved as a way to protect the country. The first uh, Tripitaka was completed, uh, you know, it took 77 years and it was the largest in volume at the time. Now the 13th century edition, called today the, the Koryo Tripitaka, uh, was begun on Kangwa Island, not too far from, from Seoul, uh, where the court had taken refuge from the Mongol attacks. Now, the first Tripitaka was mostly destroyed when the Mongols attacked. Uh, I mean, it was their way of, um, you know, making us, discouraging the country, the, the Korea people, right, to attack what they treasure most. Uh, but a few survived today in various collections, including the there are a few in Seoul, uh, but uh, there's a very large volume now surviving in Nanzeji Temple in Japan and also Tsushima Island. Uh, island. Um, and among the uh, Nanjin, Nanzenji collection, uh, there's a large volume of monumental landscape images of the Northern Song style, which is really the highlight of landscape painting in uh, the high point of landscape painting in, in China. 
And these uh, are yet to be studied in detail, actually. So this is a great uh, source of, uh, for understanding uh, the, the landscape traditions, the early landscape traditions of Korea. Now, the better known Koryo Tripitaka survives today in its entirety at the Heinsa Temple in South Gyeongsang Province. Uh, despite being produced under wartime condition, this set is regarded as the finest among the 20 versions of the Tripitaka originating in East Asia. So this is the uh, Heinsa Temple in South Gyeongsang Province, and the 80,000 blocks are stored in this library. And you notice the, the windows have uh, different sizes, the top and bottom. Um, and so the, you know, on this side, the, the top part, their lattice windows uh, are larger than the bottom ones. And on the opposite side, the top windows are smaller and the bottoms are, and this kind of creates a ventilation system. It kind of draws the wind in and out to keep the, the, the whole library um, you know, in breeze, uh, breathing. Okay, its accuracy, uh, the beauty of the calligraphic style. So this is uh, you know, in reverse. Uh, and the, the style, the calligraphic style is what we call the regular script style or kaishu in, in Chinese. And um, it follows the Ouyang Shun uh, style, which became very popular in Korea. And Ouyang Shun is an early Tang calligrapher and politician whose calligraphy, calligraphy became very popular in the Korea dynasty. And, and the exquisite carving of the wood blocks are simply astonishing. Uh, testimony to the zeal and efforts poured into this national undertaking. According to scholar Yi Gubo, uh, leading calligraphers at the time, some of whom held high posts, were involved in writing the calligraphy on paper, uh, which was then put in reverse to carve on wood. So, you know, all the best calligraphers were gathered together and they participated in, in this project and then it will be put in reverse and then carved um, uh, in reverse. Now the wood itself uh, was apparently boiled in salt water to get rid of its impurities, then carefully dried in breezing shade, and the corners were reinforced with metal to prevent from warping. So I mean, I mean imagine, I'm, I have wood furniture at home and I only for 10 years is already warping. So this has survived a thousand years, you know, uh, and the secret for it, I mean, you wonder. And so they had a way of making wood that was very durable, and it, was, it required a process, right? Uh, so after this, you know, getting the right wood, they, 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 uh, uh, they gathered together the best calligraphers, and then they carved the whole thing, and, and there are 80,000 blocks of it in total. Um, so not only were they beautiful, but also they were very accurate. And its accuracy was confirmed when the 20th century modern print, you know, um, that was compiled by, the, uh, by, by Japan, uh, known as the Taisho edition, uh, most closely followed the Koryo Tripitaka of the 13th century. So this 13th century um, Buddhist canon, I mean, you know, there's the Christian tradition and then there's the Buddhist tradition in, in Asia. And so for the um, you know, uh, Chinese version, this is stand as the most uh, accurate um, to this day. Okay. Um, now, in addition, Koryo also produced some of the most exquisite illuminated Buddhist texts. Now, these are handwritten, um, and they're written in silver and painted in gold, as you see. The government established, you know, Kumjawan and Unjawan, like separate uh, workshops that would specialize in this. So those who painted in gold and those who painted in silver. And these monk artisans were um, so greatly admired by the Yuan Chinese court that uh, the Chinese requested on six occasions uh, a dispatch of sutra monks to be sent to China. So they were sent, you know, one time 60 of them and another time 100 of them to China to, you know, these uh, illuminated sutra painters. So these were also very uh, greatly admired at the time. So uh, you see here, this is, uh, there are different types. There's a scroll type. Uh, the one you see here is an accordion book style. So it folds up into a narrow vertical 
uh, shape. So there's a title page and then there is an illustration uh, in gold and then followed by the, um, the text in silver. So this is the most sort of precious things you can have, you know. Um, and you see the, the, the painting also is very detailed, very, um, a lot of patterns, and just very intricate, you know, this kind of aesthetics that they pursued at the time was uh, intricacy. Okay, another example at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, when the Met opened their Korean art gallery, uh, among the many things they own, they put this on the cover of the catalog. So this work decorated the cover of the book. Um, so just, um, so when, when, whenever any of these things show up in, in, a, in the market, like in an auction, they can easily go for you know, a couple of million of, the, of dollars, actually, because they're very uh, precious and rare. And if a museum owns one of these, then you know, you're, uh, it will become a very important collection. Okay, then last but not least is the invention of the movable metal, metal print, which appears to be the culmination for the widespread demand for Buddhist scriptures at the time. Now, Igibo wrote in Dongguk Isangukjip that by 1234, movable metal print was already in use. The Jikji Shinche Yojol, or the anthology of great Buddhist priest Zen teachings dated to 1377, is the oldest existing book of movable metal print in the world, predating the Gutenberg Bible by 78 years. Uh, now only the second volume survives. Uh, now this is now in the collection of the National Library of France. Uh, any French here present? Um, Anyway, this was collected, the story about this, how it got to be uh, in France is very interesting. Uh, this was collected by a diplomat, a French minister who was in Korea at the end of the 19th century. Uh, he served two terms. His name was Victor Collin de Plancy, who was an avid collector of artworks and also old books. And he had an eye for good books, I can, I can see, and sent them to France. So this was included and was exhibited at the World Expo in Paris in 1900. And uh, uh, before he died, he donated many of his collection from his diplomatic life in China, Korea, Japan, and Bangkok to his alma mater. I think it was a language school, uh, some school of oriental languages. Uh, and he also sold 700 Korean pieces uh, in, uh, into an auction. Uh, including this print, uh, which, is, uh, which was bought by Henri Bever, Henri Bever here, right, uh, for 180 francs. I don't know how much that would be at the time. But then, uh, so he later donated, uh, he, he had, a, had his will to donate it to the National Library. So this is a story about how the oldest print, surviving print of movable type, got to be in a French collection. It's thanks to some very, uh, uh, some diplomats with a good eye yeah, and, and taste, I would say. Anyway, the North-South uh, Korea joint archaeological excavations of Kaesong have further led to discoveries of the actual metal types. Uh, there has been uh, eight joint excavations from 2007 to 2018. So uh, this is the view of the Manolte, the old palace grounds. And so each time they have uh, designated an area and uh, conducted uh, uh, ex uh, joint excavations. So it's a, it's a nice uh, way to kind of, uh, you know, with uh, uh, people with scholastic, scholastic purposes getting together um, despite of political differences. Um, I had the good fortune to visit Kaesong uh, back in 2008 with a group of Asian art curators from around the world. Um, so there are just, uh, you know, a few dozen of us um, who are overseeing Korean art collections at the museum. So they were from all over, Russia, Mexico, America, Europe, and, and so on. So this was, uh, I think there may be more now, but there were just a few Korean art curators, just four of us here. Uh, but anyway, we made a short trip to Kaesong. Uh, it's only 53.7 kilometers. Uh, I was just very surprised how, how 
short it was, and we were there in North Korea. And of course, we are, you know, we could only go to certain places, but uh, it was just a day trip. Anyway, uh, the 2015 excavation revealed a metal type uh, that uh, probably predates 1361. Uh, and this was very exciting um, because at the time, South Korea was in possession of only one uh, that was discovered from a private tomb in Kaesong, uh, now kept at the National Museum of Korea. So this provided a comparable material to establish its importance. And I think there has been more discoveries recently. Okay, so much for printing. And let's move on to sculpture. Uh, now, Koryu produced the largest surviving cast iron Buddha statue in Korea, which measures almost three meters in height. Uh, iron is not generally considered an, an ideal material for producing Buddhist sculptures for various reasons, uh, including its rough surface, uh, the, its high melting point, and its tendency to rapidly harden as the temperature decreases. Now, these characteristics make it very difficult to create elaborate sculptural details, such as facial expressions, hands, and the creases in the robe. This sculpture at the National Museum of Korea is believed to have been cast with the surrender weapons at the beginning of the dynasty as a symbol of peace at the end of the ceaseless battles. It is believed to have been commissioned by the father-in-law of the founder of the dynasty, uh, who was the father of the 15 and 16 wives, and so it's a nice story how uh, now that the new dynasty has opened, they have uh, melted their weapons into a uh, Buddhist sculpture, which is symbolizes for, as a symbol of peace. Now, this sculpture is estimated to have been originally covered with lacquer and then covered with gold leaf, which is uh, now uh, remains very little. Now, Buddhist sculptures are often uh, gilded or painted in gold. Uh, reflecting the belief that the Buddha had a radiant gold body. So you can see this at the National Museum when you go there. It's the largest surviving iron Buddha eh, sculpture, Buddhist sculpture. And there are several of them. Um, now, monumentality and massive scale seems to have been of interest to Korea sculptures, as evident in the numerous extant Buddhist statues around the country. And I'm showing you here an example, uh, the Kwanchoksa Bodhisattva, which measures 18 meters high, and the imposing rod-cut standing statues at Yongmiri Paju on the right. Uh, so, you know, you come to Koryo, there seems to be, you know, it's an empire, and uh, these massive Buddhist sculptures, you know, something about scale that they were interested in. So, uh, they, you know, they uh, start building, so lots of them, a lot of uh, rock cut Buddhist sculptures are found from Koryo Dynasty, uh, you know, marking places and, uh, and serving as an icon for the people, uh, for unity and also for uh, expressing uh, the new power of the country. Uh, now, in addition to monumentality, now everything is very big in Koryo, you realize. Uh, this is a, a steely um, monument. Um, so in, in addition to size, intricacy and elaborate details also characterize the carvings of various stone monuments. Uh, now this is a, these are um, royal, uh, this is the steely base and cover uh, that commemorate the royal Buddhist abbots. And these are found in the provinces in, uh, you know, Yeoju and, and Wonju, and you can travel there. Uh, I think these are accessible by everybody. And uh, these are, there are some uh, temple remains uh, that are being, uh, you know, excavated and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, taken care of. So, yeah, I was just, uh, I made a trip there with a Korea specialist, uh, and I was just stunned about, I mean, this is not even the, in the capital, these are in the provinces, and about the intricacy and, and the size and, the, and just the, the, um, you know, the, the, the quality of the work uh, compared to other periods, yeah. Now, skillful craftsmanship of the Korea people is perhaps best represented also in Korea Saladons, uh, which boast beautiful glaze colors and elegant flowing shapes. An exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago described them as having the radiance of jade and the clarity of water. 
Now, Chinese celadons from uh, UA kilns, so I'm showing you here on the right a Chinese celadon. So you notice that there's a slightly different tinge of the glaze. It's more of an olive green glaze uh, compared to the cooler blue, bluish green hue of the Korea celadons. Now, 10th century Korean potters modify Chinese techniques to produce their own version of celadons, achieving a uniform glaze color. So it, it was the amount of iron that determined the glaze color. Uh, and it was also uh, the way they, they, they uh, produced this. So Korea artisans developed a two-step firing process. The first step is what is called a bisque firing, which dries out and hardens the vessels to make them stable and easier to handle. This is then glazed. And then the second firing is at a higher temperature of about 1250 to 1300 degrees Celsius. Um, you know, when you think, when you talk about ceramics, this is about technology also. I mean, this will compare to, I think, smartphones today. I mean, it's the type of, what type of ceramics you could produce at the time will reflect what kind of technology you have with you. So they could, they, you know, they could, you know, uh, they could make this at, at very high temperatures. Uh, and then uh, at the second firing, this is then glazed and uh, this is fired in a low oxygen reducing atmosphere to produce the desired celadon of color and glossy texture. Now the difference between the Chinese um, kilns and the Korean kilns is that the Chinese potters fire their celadons in brick kilns while the Korean artisans use traditional mud kilns that effectively block the flow of oxygen to produce a brilliant celadon tone. So the secret was the reducing the amount of oxygen in the air. And this was achieved by covering the, uh, the kiln with mud completely, completely seal it so that it would not, uh, you would not get any extra oxygen. So that, that was the secret for attaining that uh, brilliant color, the bluish color that they could uh, attained. Now, forms in, uh, were often inspired from nature, and I'm wondering whether you could guess what kind of, uh, what may have been the inspiration from the one on the left. Have you had a melon like this? This is a Korean melon, a yellow melon, chame, okay. So a bottle inspired from a Korean melon. And the one on the right, any guesses? Yes, oh, I've already shown you, so you've, <laughs> I've given out the answer. Okay, the bamboo shoot, yeah. So this is a, a kind of a Korean characteristic. Another one, example of, um, you know, with the bamboos and using the little crevices that gathers the, uh, the glaze and gives it a kind of a darker hue in between. And some, some uh, shapes are very complex, like, like the one you see on the right. Uh, they feature latticed open work. Uh, so it shows the careful handiwork involved in making these luxury goods. Now, um, these celadons are admired for the glaze and also for their shape. They are subtle and suavely flowing. The neck and the body and the foot are smoothly and fluently connected. So this sort of the, the beauty of the line. I mean, the Japanese, when they came to Korea, also kind of remarked the, the, the linear, the beauty, the beautiful linear quality of Korean art. So I mean, just the way the lines flow really fluidly, you know, like water. And also decoration is not loud. The decoration is there to enhance the shape of the pot. So it's spare, it's chaste and restrained. And you see here the lotus flower is positioned right here in incisions, subtle incisions, and, but it's not crying out loud to tell you, look at me, but is there in harmony with the overall shape of the pot. Yeah. So this kind of very subtlety, you know, this subtlety and very elegant kind of taste uh, is evident here. So, um, yeah, these vessels were on, uh, acquired uh, gained great admiration of the Chinese scholarly elite, as evident in these quotes. Uh, there was a person named Taiping Lao Ren uh, who wrote in, in Shu Zhongjin, the 12 small wonders of the world. I mean, this is like in 
Sound of Music, you have my 10 favorite things, right? You'll have your list of 10 favorite things, you know, the cheesecake somewhere in your pretzels or somewhere, and anyway. So he wrote down the things that he likes, you know, the books of the academy, the wines of the palace, the inkstones of Duanxi, the peonies of Luoyang, the tea of Fujian, the brocades of Sichuan, the porcelain of Dingzhou, and then among the 12, this is a Song scholarly elite at the height of, you know, the Chinese dynasty. He, he included the Saladins of Koryo, eh, are all first under heaven. So I mean, China was producing the best ceramics, right? That's where, that's what we call China ware, right? Yeah. Um, and I mean, all, you know, you, just all around the world. I mean, and the Europeans were imitating Chinese wares, right? The, like in Delft, uh, in the Dutch, for example, there was like imitation Chinese ware and the blue and white porcelain, all of that. So anyway, uh, so they're making the, just many different kinds of cell, you know, ceramics of all kinds. But as far as the Saladons went, I mean, they really fell in love with the Korean Saladons. Now the quote on the right is by Xu Qing, who was an emissary who visited Korea in, 12, in, in the 12th century. He was paying homage at, for, to attend the funeral of a passing king. And then while he was in Korea, he recorded everything that he saw. And so he left a record. And he apparently also left some illustrations, but those were lost. But anyway, this provides a really important account of, uh, of the uh, Korea at the time. And he was also very impressed with the uh, table uh, he writes, table service is vast and includes gold and silver vessels, but their Saladin pieces are even more precious. So um, it seems at the time, yeah, we were able to impress uh, the Chinese with our ceramics. So that would be like galaxy phones or something in present day, I would compare it to. Anyway, and, and what happened was uh, another invention that happened was in the 12th century. Uh, we started to inlay our saladons, and this is something that the Chinese did not do. And this is called sangam, and this was the most dramatic invention by the Koryo potters. And it is believed that this was inspired by bronze vessels that were inlaid with silver. You know, so we have bronze vessels surviving with inlaid silver designs. So you, you find like similar shape. This is a, a, a water bottle called kundika that was used in Buddhist rituals. So it's a way to gather water. They will put a filter on top. So gather clean water and then sprinkle it from the top. It was a kind of a filtering system. Uh, anyway, so we find uh, you know, ceramic wares that are you know, almost identical to, in shape to some metal works. So it is believed that this inlaying was inspired by, by the inlaying that was going on in other media. And I'm just wondering, I mean, you know, usually in a Korea, it's a small country and enough things going on and they had the extra energy to start like carving out their ceramic, which were already beautiful and they were willing to do extra work to it. Uh, and inlay is done with, uh, uh, the way it's done is you fill in, you carve out and fill in, fill in with a white or colored slip, which is a kind of a, a water clay mixture of different colors, sometimes white, sometimes dark. So you fill it in and so to create a contrast. So some other inlaying uh, materials. So on the left is a uh, inlaid bronze uh, with uh, silver. Uh, so willow tree is carved here. And also Korea, Korea produced beautiful inlaid mother of pearl lacquer. So intricate. I mean, um, and this is uh, uh, done by, you know, the, the shells, you know, inside carving out the inside of uh, abalone shells, the iridescent color, and carved out in different shapes. And then at the last stage of the lacquerware, uh, they were inlaid on, on, on the surface of the lacquerwares, and also inlaid with brass wires around it. So these are like some sutra boxes that survive from the 12th century. So anyway, um, intricacy is prevalent everywhere. And these are some examples of the best inlaid Saladon from the Koryo dynasty. Uh, this piece uh, from Kanzong Art Museum. Uh, Kanzong was a very important collector uh, in the 20th century who would sell houses to buy art. Uh, so he's, it's one of the most important private collections in Korea. And they, they open, they have exhibitions once in a while, um, fall and spring. 
Uh, this on the right is a flute also with the inlaid designs. And cranes are symbols of you know, lofty spirits of scholars and, and also symbols of Taoism. So they, they're shown here flying among clouds. So this kind of very lofty kind of uh, uh, designs carved on, uh, on, on their items. So anyway, you find uh, celadons, you know, uh, they, they also made roof tiles, they made stools, they made everything. And I, I hope you have a chance to watch a video as, as to how this is made. I mean, just so, you know, it's, it's a very elaborate process. And they will kind of, they will break something that is not perfect. So uh, to attain something like this, I mean, the amount of work and the wood and all the, you know, burning, you know, day and night uh, to control the temperature to get the right uh, color of the glaze uh, must have been really uh, very uh, attuned uh, technology. Okay, uh, then I'd like to move on to uh, painting. So um, now our understanding of Goryeo Buddhist painting has made notable advancements only in the last 40 years. This exhibition at the Yamato Bunkakan in Japan in 1978 sang, signaled the first significant effort that gathered 49 paintings identified as Goryeo Buddhist paintings. Um, I mean, this is kind of, we, we had very little understanding of Goryeo Buddhist paintings until just the last 40 years, this shows you. And this was the first significant effort that gathered together uh, Buddhist paintings with inscriptions that clearly identify them as Koryo. So this was held in 1978. And just to uh, give you an anecdote as to how uh, little we knew about Koryo Buddhist paintings, uh, back in 19, late 1980s when I was a graduate school in New Jersey, uh, you know, uh, Koryo paintings would often be mislabeled, uh, like in this auction catalog at Sotheby's. Uh, lot number seven had a clearly Koryo Buddhist painting, but then it was called a fine Chinese painting, uh, Sung or Yuan, and it was estimated to be about twenty uh, to thirty thousand dollars. Now, guess what? Uh, yeah, it was sold for uh, half a million, uh, and the the high, uh, the bid went to a collector of uh, a lover of Koryo Buddhist art uh, from Japan, actually. So it's in his collection now. Anyway, uh, also uh, these two paintings in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, one was labeled Chinese and the other one was labeled Japanese when I was studying at the graduate school. And after we had our seminar in the fall of 1990, these two paintings have been reattributed to be Koryo paintings. In 1994, when I was at the uh, Sackler Gallery, this has been renamed the National Museum of Asian Art because of the name of Sackler. I mean, this was a, you see, there's kind of scandalous, right? They've been selling um, painkillers that have become addictive, and so this has been revealed, and now everybody's taking off the name Sackler. So anyway, it's now been renamed the National Museum of Asian Art. Uh, this painting came as part of a, a donation of Japanese artworks. And the Japanese curator came to me and said, what do you think about this? And I said, oh my god, this must be Koryo. And uh, so, uh, so things like this will surface, you know, pop up um, uh, by surprise. And so one by one, uh, Koryo Buddhist paintings have been identified and accumulated. And as of 2019, now we have about uh, over 160 Koryo Buddhist paintings identified. Uh, there's a scholar also from the study in Japan uh, came back. Many of them come from Japan. They surface from Japanese collections. Uh, yeah, most of them, 130 plus, are located in Japan. About 20 in Europe and US, and only about 10 in Korea, actually, surprisingly. So that's the situation. Yeah. So there has been, you know, like uh, some uh, group. Uh, you know, uh, fundraisers that would buy a Koryo Buddhist art and donate it to the National Museum of Korea. So, you know, companies would have been donating funds for the purchase of Koryo Buddhist paintings. Now, in terms of uh, 
In terms of their dating, now there's a, you know, it's great, we're identifying many of them, but the, 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 another trick about this is that the, most of the, the paintings with inscriptions fall into the late 13th to early 14th centuries. Uh, therefore, uh, we only have an understanding of late Koryo dynasty paintings. You know, it, it's a long dynasty and we only, we just have a concentration of Buddhist paintings from the late Koryo dynasty. So our understanding of Koryo is still very partial, in other words. Now my, my PhD dissertation uh, focused on this set of Ten Kings paintings in the collection of Japan. Uh, it's in a library called the Seikado Library. And this intrigued me. I was doing uh, research on the Ten Kings. And it was, there was nobody had touched upon them, although it was designated important cultural property of Japan. And the reason for that is because it looks so different from all the surviving Ten Kings paintings. Now, the majority of Ten Kings paintings from China look like the one on the left here. Uh, there was a workshop in Ningpo in southern China that mass produced them and exported to Japan. So a lot of these are found in Japan. And they all look more or less like this. And this is a typical uh, Southern Song uh, or Yuan uh, Ten Kings painting style. So you have the king uh, passing judgment to the dead souls in the afterlife in purgatory. And so you see it's a much simpler composition, much lesser figures. It's much more narrative, you know, the king is in action and passing judgment. So it's a, uh, uh, which, uh, while the, the ten kings on the right uh, it's completely different. It's an uh, enlarged king which, still, uh, which sits still. It's holding a scepter. Uh, it's definitely very iconic in, in nature and it's meant to be worshipped. There's an a incense burner placed in front of him and he's surrounded by a plethora of figures. So there's an enlarged you know, number of retinues. And the surprisingly, uh, no one had no one, could, no one could decide what these were. So some were calling it Yuan, Ming, Chinese, and Koryo maybe, but they, wouldn't, they weren't really saying why. You know. So this really intrigued me and this became uh, my PhD dissertation. Anyway, when you look at it, these are complete, they're extremely complex and the screen paintings in that back the Ten Kings are very uh, diverse. There's landscape as well as flower paintings, dragon design, uh, you know, uh, Taoist subjects, and it really goes in spirit with the you know pluralist environment of Koryo, I thought, and also the way the the you know it's become very uh, luxurious. The king is <coughs> uh, attended by this um, uh, feathered. Um, pick up feather fans on the side, and this kind of luxuri luxuriousness that permeates these paintings really, uh, uh, you know, distinguish it from the Chinese examples. But anyway, it's a long story, and many, are many points to point out, but just to make a long story short, uh, this Ten King Sutra from the Heinza woodblock print provided a key evidence for the identification of the iconography. And uh, this Heinza print provides uh, a frontispiece with a list of retinues, 128 retainers, uh, that include uh, magistrates, demon kings, generals, and so on, you know, and also Daoming and poisonous demon king, which is unique to Korea. Anyways, this is not found in China. There is nothing like this in China. It's uniquely Korean, and this provided the key evidence for identifying uh, for arguing for the Korean um, uh, origin of these paintings. Also some details in the painting, the peak of feather fans, there are records in the uh, Gao Li Du Qing that uh, describe them, you know, Xu Qing, the emissary, the ambassador in Korea, was noticing them and was, you know, describing them in detail and it fits exactly the description that, it, you know, that he portrayed. Also beautiful landscapes, uh, in the back, flower paintings, peonies. 
Anyway, I wrote a book on this, and, um, and uh, this was 20 years after my PhD dissertation. I had given all the time for people to come up with counter argument, and there has been just very little, and I, I've gotten very good uh, supporting reviews so far, so, uh, several of them. So I think this will uh, be securely uh, established as Koryo painting to adding. And I argue that these are probably mid Koryo dynasty paintings that fill in the gap. And I've given lectures at different uh, places. Anyway, just to conclude, I think my time is up, right? In short, uh, Koryo was a period that made unparalleled achievements in technology, Buddhist art and culture, the decorative arts, and the decorative arts. Their true scope is still in the process of being unveiled and identified, and much more lies ahead to be revealed. At the same time, as you saw, the stakeholders of important Korea artworks are dispersed in North Korea, Japan, Europe, and others. Therefore, Korea offers great opportunity for future international collaboration. There has only been one major international exhibition on Korea art uh, back in 2003. So I hope uh, that many more opportunities will arise in the future to deepen our understanding of one of the most uh, brilliant era in Korea's history. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Professor Yuram, for an informative lecture. All right. Uh, it was so uh, astonishing and very intriguing presentation, even for me as a Korean, because uh, I couldn't have enough chance to be exposed to Korea arts and those kind of exhibitions. And, and, and thanks to her distinguished and very extraordinary explanation for Korea dynasty it was so helpful and made me so kind of emotional uh, and then make me proud of our history again. All right, this is the end of today's meeting. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for being with us today and also extend my gratitude to the staff of the Academy of Korean Studies who have contributed to make this meaningful lecture. We hope to see you all again next year. Okay, now let us open the banquet for your dining pleasure. Please enjoy your meal. This has been Claire Kim. Thank you very much.